everyone and welcome and thank you for attending this webinar with Fullscript and uh, Tracy Harrison from the School of Applied Functional Medicine. My name is Kaylee. I'm with Fullscript and we're very excited to have Tracy here with us today. She is the founder and lead educator at uh, the School of Applied Functional Medicine, as I said, and she's here to take us on a deep dive into the functional medicine interconnectedness of bone health. Um, before we get started, though, a little housekeeping. Uh, just a reminder that this is being recorded, so all it, all registrants actually will get a, um, a link to the recording after the event, um, as well as Tracy is able to provide us with her, her presentation slides. So we'll also um, give you access to that. If you miss it in your email, it's always available on Fullscript's website at fullscript.com slash webinars. So it'll live there. You can find it there as well. And um, on your dashboard, you'll also, or your control panel, you'll also notice that there's a question section. Um, feel free to add your questions as we go. Tracy will be able to um, answer as we go and try to maybe get to any, any bigger ones towards the end of the presentation. So um, again, I'd like to thank Tracy for being here today. If you don't know a little bit about Tracy, she is deeply passionate about transforming both the quality and affordability of healthcare for chronic disease by actually addressing the root cause of these epidemics. She actually left 17 years in corporate high tech at the pinnacle of her career, built a widely successful multimodality health coaching practice, and then in 2011 founded the School of Applied Functional Medicine. Um, the school or School AFM teaches accredited advanced training in functional medicine to thousands of healthcare practitioners from 55 countries across 20 different modalities. Uh, the school attracts practitioners who want to be on the leading edge of the future of effective healthcare and gives both rigorous knowledge and practical know-how. Know so I feel like I could go on and on, but um, <laughs> I'm going to pass it over to you and get started on uh, the presentation. Excellent. Thank you so much, Kaylee. I appreciate yeah. that. Um, I appreciate the opportunity, as always, to educate to provide inspiration, empowerment, knowledge to healthcare practitioners. And I, I want to thank everyone who's here uh, as a part of a kindred spirit appreciators of full script and the services uh, that they make available to so many practitioners. Uh, I'm delighted to be with you today to talk about a topic that I find outside of people who really focus on it as maybe a, an expertise in their clinical practice, we don't tend to talk about bone health very much. Uh, or if it is, it's more from the viewpoint of perhaps specifically engaging to address osteoporosis as a disease dynamic in and of itself. And as we often do at the School of Applied Functional Medicine, I actually want to talk a bit more about the context of the interconnectedness of bones uh, with the rest of uh, our uh, physiology and biochemistry and uh, perhaps some surprising aspects of bone health that we don't necessarily focus on. So often the topic of bone health focuses on estrogen and calcium. <laughs> Those are the two things that matter most, right? Or maybe estrogen, calcium, and vitamin D in more progressive uh, communities. But there's quite a bit more about the role of bones in maintaining uh, systemic balance uh, the particular interconnectedness of a whole host of different chronic disease epidemics and how they affect bones, and then what we can best perhaps do as practitioners to support our unique patients and clients with finding good long-term uh, viability and function of bones. Uh, and so as a reminder, as Kaylee said, you are gonna receive these slides, so uh, hopefully you can relax a bit with regard to note-taking, but I am happy for you to post your questions on the, um, the GoToWebinar dashboard uh, as we move along. Uh, but I want to quickly just step through some basics as a way of getting started. Most of you have received some type of anatomy and physiology training, uh, and you're aware of bones and their, their functional, their primary functional system in the body. Uh, but in terms of things we don't necessarily always think about, uh, we need to remember that, of course, uh, bones are alive. I think it's much more accurate to think about bones being actual organs uh, in the body rather than just 
part of our anatomy of structure. And a reminder that bones are, if healthy, constantly uh, breaking themselves down and building themselves back up. And it's a very active matrix tissue that thrives not just with mineral fortification, which is where our focus on calcium comes from, uh, and indeed bones are certainly where we keep the vast majority of our calcium, but the collagen backbone that holds all of that interstitial mineral density that gives bones their strength is equally, and in some camps, I think we could argue even more important than the mineral density. And of course that collagen is also essential for the various other uh, softer tissues uh, that are necessary for protecting bone and for actually activating bone and providing structural function for the body. It's a good reminder that everything in the body is made from nutrients uh, and that our systemic functioning thrives or not based on what we're putting in and that amino acid sufficiency, in particular, as it relates to collagen, we think about amino acids that collagen is made up of primarily such as glycine and, and proline or hydroxyproline. And that these are the, the amino acids that are not as prevalent in the modern Western diet where people are much more likely to choose um, a lean muscle cuts of meat uh, as opposed to in prior times when animal proteins were much more expensive and we would be more likely to consume all sorts of different tissues, uh, precious amino acids like glycine, which end up often being conditionally essential in many humans, are found much more densely in the connective tissue found in the tougher core, uh, cuts of meat that we just don't tend to eat as much anymore. Those that involve marinating and slow cooking. And this is one of the reasons in which we can end up with an imbalance in the amino acids that we can consume, perhaps getting too much methionine, uh, which fires up the methylation cycle. Um, definitely an essential amino acid, but like everything else, optimal functioning in the body is achieved from balance. And so we need to make sure that our patients are getting sufficiency of all of these other less prevalent amino acids. And like anything else, whether it's bringing on board amino acids from dietary proteins or minerals uh, from a rich diversity of foods, we have to consider that nutrition is not just um, we are what we eat. Uh, that's a woefully oversimplified phrase. We are actually what we eat, digest, absorb, convert to final forms, and get past the cell membrane, which is a much higher hurdle uh, for ensuring actual um, functional nutrition uh, in the intracellular environment. And we need to be thinking always that bone health is dependent on uh, the health of the gastrointestinal tract, the sufficiency of our nutrient absorption, and that there are many different things that can stand in the way and block the function of our digestion and absorption of nutrients. Anything from insulin resistance that makes it much more likely that people will have exocrine pancreatic um, insufficiency where we don't have enough digestive enzymes in order to thoroughly break down our foods and in particular separating the minerals from the, the proteins uh, from which they come into our body to uh, an overgrowth of H. pylori in the gastric cavity, which lowers our stomach acid and creates hypochlorhydria. And when we have suboptimal stomach acid, we're not as effective at denaturing those proteins so that our enzymes can cleave the individual amino acids and polypeptide chains to support our systemic uh, needs. Now, we talk a lot at SAFM about the interconnectedness of all of these things and how so much disease can begin in the gut because of maldigestion uh, or malabsorption, for example. But um, a few other just basic uh, facts here about bones uh, that you can review. But at the end of the day, I think it's critical to remember that the bones are not as uh, perhaps boring as we are so often to believe, just in terms of providing uh, structure. Uh, many people uh, think about bones as being fixed and static and to some extent dead. Uh, and 
um, the best we can hope for is to just maintain uh, the health uh, of that stagnant tissue. Uh, but in fact, uh, bones are very much alive and can be much more accurately thought about as organs. But before I go there, I do want to say just a few words about the structural uh, features of bones, because it's absolutely key that bones give us this uh, uh, structure on which all of our organ systems and certainly our muscles in terms of enlivening our, our limbs and so much of our organ systems, oh, it's hanging on that framework. But we too often function, we too often focus, excuse me, primarily on the strength of bones. And it is absolutely true that good mineral density is essential for the strength of bones. But we don't often focus on the importance of bones being flexible. And I think the best analogy for educating your patients about this in a way that they can clearly understand is that ideally healthy bones are very much like a good healthy tree. We would certainly like for trees to be strong, right? Where they can withstand uh, different types of uh, shock and pressure and hold up under their own weight. But we also know that in order to survive, uh, trees optimally are quite flexible and they are able to sway in the wind and actually bend uh, in order to handle a pretty significant amount of pressure and trauma without breaking. Uh, and in a, an extrapolated way, this is why the attachments of bones to the rest of the musculoskeletal system is so essential. Uh, we actually don't so much want to count on our bones being bearing the weight and, and being the foundational strength of the body. It's actually the attachment of muscles to bones that give us our composite strength. And it's actually the attachment of bones to those joints that give us optimal flexibility. So when we're talking about long-term bone health and function, we must necessarily be talking also about all of the softer tissues, the, the health of joints and ligaments and tendons, but also the health of our muscles. Now, when we focus on uh, bones in particular, we want to remember that bones get their strength uh, very much from the same structural uh, framework that a pair of skis do, for example, snow skis or water skis. Uh, and that is uh, very much being designed to be a composite, a reinforced composite material, where again, we have this, uh, this a matrix that has uh, collagen fibers and also these deposits of minerals that collectively give both strength and flexibility to our bone tissue. Uh, uh, crystal hydroxyapatite uh, is the form in which calcium and uh, phosphorus and to a lesser degree other key minerals like magnesium and potassium and boron come together uh, in optimal ratios in order to strike this balance between strength and flexibility. And from a supplementation viewpoint, increasingly we're seeing actual hydroxy appetite available in order to ensure that we're bringing on board supplemental minerals where they're needed in appropriate uh, ratios. And it's, it's certainly true that maintaining bone mass density as we age is essential. And there are a number of different modern dynamics I'm going to get to in just a second that um, can detract from that and actually set up a chronic disease dynamic in the body that has as one of its hallmarks a progressive degradation in retained uh, bone density. Uh, but it's also important that we avoid the possibility of fracture by avoiding falls. And I'm going to talk more about this in a moment, but, but one of the first myths that I want to bust is that most fractures come because people have low bone mass density. Of course, that's not true. People break bones because they fall. Uh, and uh, certainly highly weakened bones can indeed fracture because of a, a sudden relatively minor, minor to moderate impact. Um, but but the, the number one reason for fractures is falling. 
And so, so much of our work as practitioners to help people to maintain healthy bones is about preventing falling, which of course takes us appreciably outside of a limited system view of just focusing on bones. And I'll share more with you on that in just a moment. But I also want to talk about some of the other broader perspective with regard to the role of bones, which, as I said earlier, we don't tend to think about as being uh, particularly uh, esoteric or scientifically sexy in terms of their role in the body. But um, the truth is far from that uh, assumption. If we think about bones as organs, we come back to some long, uh, well-understood truths that bone marrow is actually where we produce uh, all of our blood cells, uh, red blood cells to promote oxygenation uh, in the body, white blood cells to fuel our immune system, platelets uh, in order to spread uh, serotonin and also to help with the key blood clotting function. But in, in focusing on bones in a limited framework of primarily providing structure, we can lose sight of interconnectedness such as the long-term health of bone is essential for the long-term health and consistency of blood cell synthesis, right? Hemopoiesis, uh, producing 500 billion blood cells daily. And again, bringing us back to just how active bones are at every moment of our lives as vital organs. Uh, we have extremely active uh, stem cells internal to our uh, bones, which are not just about producing um, osteoblasts that create new bone tissue, but also chondroblasts, fibroblasts, producing more soft tissue, uh, and also adipocytes. And a surprising fact for many practitioners is to um, realize that as we age, more and more of that life-providing red bone marrow is actually replaced with adipose tissue. We focus so much in today's modern epidemics about what happens when tissue becomes fatty, right? Uh, a fatty liver, fatty uh, skeletal muscles, fatty pancreas that impairs uh, synthesis and release of insulin, for example. But bone marrow also becomes fatty and becomes yellow uh, bone marrow. And it, it's uh, some amount of yellow bone marrow is normal. It's actually storage, energy storage for triglycerides in the body. But yellow bone marrow is the third largest fat depot uh, in the body. And as we age, we can end up with an excessive conversion of red bone marrow to yellow bone marrow. Excuse me. And this overtly impairs hemopoiesis as we age. Uh, this level of adipose tissue internal to the bone reflects overall adiposity in the systemic body and actually has a returning effect on whole body metabolic health, which I'll talk about in just a moment. But most of us don't think about, much less educate our patients, that the health of the bones is key as regulatory organs that affect our metabolic health. Bones may be suddenly sexy. But it's also true that bones are not this stagnant, you know, dead, uh, rock-like tissue in the body. Ideally, bones are constantly remodeling themselves. And again, just a brief refresher, I'm sure most of you are familiar, but it's osteoblasts that build new bone tissue. And, and interestingly enough, what actually happens is the osteoblasts are synthesizing new bone, um, and they are there in the secretion of new bone matrix, those cells get trapped in their own secretions and they become osteocytes, which is the classic bone cell that we think of. But osteo, um, osteocytes are not, again, stagnant tissue. They are live, active cells that still have to support their own metabolism and detoxification. Uh, and um, uh, pro-oxidant, antioxidant balance. 
and uh, osteocytes themselves secrete growth factors that regulate the activities of osteoblasts and osteoclasts. And ideally throughout our lives, other than uh, episodic imbalances in response to the environment in which we're asking our body to live, we keep a good balance of breaking down old bone because bone does age, it does become old and, and more brittle. Um, and, and then the breaking down the old bone and then building up the new bone. In fact, this well explains some of the most common devastating side effects of the, some of the modern medications that are prescribed for osteoporosis that overtly just stop the body from breaking down old bone tissue. Well, that makes DEXA scans look better. It, look, it makes bones de look denser, right? But it's taking away the truth that the bones progressively are maintaining a density of older, more brittle bone because we are stopping basically the bone's natural revitalization process. And we are not designed, no part of the body is designed to simply be locked in stasis with no ability to turn itself over. It is our natural role of our immune system to break down uh, old dysfunctional cells that allows the replenishment with the new, fresh, highly functional cell that keeps all of our tissues as vital uh, and functional as possible. But osteoclast, are the, the cells that break down bone. And I find all too often uh, practitioners think about, oh, osteoclast and osteoblast are the two types of bone cells and they're competing and they're balancing. But we don't often think of or remember that osteoclasts are actually cells of the immune system, right? They're a simply uh, a modified type of, of monocyte that is indeed seeing the concern, the threat of older bone tissue and breaking it down on purpose. Just like the immune system would break down a more overtly diseased cell, like a, a cancer cell, or an immune system would break down um, a, a threatening cell, right? A pathogenic uh, or infectious cell. It is breaking down what it perceives to be a threat. Uh, to the body and its longer term vitality. And so these osteoclasts work by burrowing into the bone and by breaking down um, the osteocytes, it's leaving a cavity, right? A hole that then can be uh, filled and enriched with osteoblasts again. This constant revitalization and turning over of uh, bone tissue. Now, it's important to understand that one of the key uh, of proteins and hormones that's at play in this uh, physiology is osteocalcin. Uh, and there are other growth factors uh, as well, but in the same way that bone marrow is just not just about fortifying bones, it's enlivening blood cells, which have so many other systemic effects. Osteocalcin actually has whole body endocrine effects that span anything from uh, insulin sensitivity to testes function and reproduction to our, our cognitive function uh, in our brains. Uh, and this is a wonderful diagram and you'll see here actually throughout today's presentation that I'm giving you some clickable links in the footer uh, of our slides where you can go and get a mix of either uh, peer reviewed published resources for further exploration, which I hope you pursue, right? The Geek and Me hopes you enjoy those deep dives for further uh, learning, but also in some cases to some references that are more easily digested by your patients uh, or other members of your practice community who may want to expand their knowledge as well. But if we move beyond some of these systemic effects that I've been mentioning and hone in on um, the interconnectedness from an endocrine uh, perspective, uh, osteocalcin is one of a number of different matrix proteins that are not collagen, right? About 10% of uh, bone tissue involves other proteins. But 
uh, osteocalcin needs to be uh, what is called carboxylated, right? That's a biochemical conversion uh, in order to uh, form new dense bone tissue. And this is an opportunity to introduce a critical role of a nutrient that is often not spoken of, which is vitamin K2. Uh, I believe that uh, some of the key roles of vitamin K1 versus K2, I wish we referred to them by their uh, official scientific names rather than these shorthands, because I find too often practitioners, and especially the people at large, but even practitioners make the mistake of assuming that vitamin K without distinction is sufficient. And of course we can get lots of vitamin K for things like dark leafy green vegetables, but dark leafy green vegetables give us lots of vitamin K1, which also has really essential uh, functions in the body in particular with optimal balance blood clotting, which too much of that can create a, a, a prothrombotic type of event or risk but not enough of it risks us uh, bleeding to death. <laughs> and so uh, vitamin K sufficiency uh, is key, but K1 to support some key uh, physiology such as clotting function, but vitamin K2 has a, an essential role in the body of managing how we work with calcium. And calcium in the right places, like good, well-bound, in situ mineralization of bones is fantastic. But calcification of soft tissue, like our kidneys, like the endothelial lining of our arteries, like the pineal gland as we age, uh, can be uh, an overt contributor to some pretty dramatic disease. And so calcium, like so many other things in the body, uh, needs to be well-managed because it is potent and powerful. So again, osteoclast and their uh, turnover effects are breaking down bone tissue. They're uncarboxylating that osteocalcin, which frees it to have these systemic endocrine effects. And this is why we don't want to stop the activity of osteoclast. Not only does that leave us with seemingly dense, but more brittle, more vulnerable bone, over time, but we want to be constantly turning over bone tissue to keep systemic um, endocrine health, uh, where you, you can even see here in the diagram, although I highly recommend you go and pursue the paper this diagram comes from that's referenced in the bottom, because the, the this explanations of the role of osteocalcium, excuse me, osteocalcin in affecting things like um, the accumulation of, of fat in the liver or not, um, the insulin sensitivity in liver or not, uh, the beta cell proliferation, right? The insulin producing cells uh, in the pancreas or not. Uh, these are dramatic systemic effects that directly play into uh, epidemics that we well recognize, like uh, insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes and downstream metabolic syndrome. And so we want to support the balance of factors in loving up on our bones and nourishing and caring for our bones that allows bones to be active organs that are free, uh, ideally without synthetic chemical effects of suppressing turnover because we want to be turning over bone tissue. And in this way, if we want to replace new bone tissue, we should be so much more focused on boosting osteoblast activity rather than on uh, overtly stopping the body from turning over old bone tissue, not only for the health of the bone, but also for the health of the systemic body. Uh, the vitamin K2, as I mentioned, helps to prevent uh, the calcification of other soft tissues in the body, uh, like arteries. Uh, and there are a number of different forms. I give you a reference down below on an awesome resource from Chris Master John about the forms of vitamin K2. Fullscript has all sorts of different tools available for MK4 and also NK7 and some combination formulas with vitamin K1 or with vitamin D3, right? In terms of synergistic effects. Uh, so a wonderful uh, apothecary, online apothecary for us to consider supplement resources. 
<clears throat> but missing key nutrients is a problem for many of our patients who struggle with uh, suboptimal bone uh, density. And so we need to remember that nutrients act in symphonies, not in solos, and that uh, vitamin D and K very much act synergistically, not only in bone, but in calcium management throughout the body. But vitamin A as another fat-soluble vitamin is not only key for immune system health and um, endocrine health in terms of affecting uh, steroid hormone receptors and um, receptor function, but also that uh, vitamin D and vitamin A are taken up together into uh, receptors for activating a number of functions. And so we need to always be careful in supplementation to look at the interconnectedness of nutrients and not just recommend super high doses of singular nutrients that may actually create in their wake deficiencies of others. And so certainly uh, dramatically boosting vitamin D3 may be key for people who are deficient in it, but we need to make sure that we're looking at the interconnectedness, right? Uh, vitamin D needs plenty of magnesium to convert it to its final form. So we should be checking for magnesium sufficiency before we add vitamin D3. Uh, and it, especially as we age, we should always make sure that there's plenty of vitamin K2 in the diet. Um, or if not, boost that also via supplementation to make sure that calcium is well managed. Just a simple example of the symphony of nutrients that we should be looking at rather than recommending singular ones. Uh, I do wanna say a few words about preventing falling. Uh, if the number one reason for age-related fractions fractures is falling, we wanna keep people on their feet. It's actually frailty, poor balance, unsteady gait, low muscle strength that are the key contributors. And most fracture patients who have actually had a dramatic fall don't have osteoporosis. Can it be coincidence? Uh, coincident? Absolutely. But that's not nearly as common as a lot of marketing related messages about bone health in the popular medical media would have you believe. That sells a lot of drugs, but it doesn't show true when we actually go to look at the, the data. And I, I've given you a number of references here to check to learn more about that uh, yourself if you wish to do a deeper dive. Um, but if we just boost bone density and we're not looking, especially as people age, at the common contributors to impaired balance, this is a question that isn't often asked, especially in the context of osteopenia or osteoporosis. Do you have impaired balance? Do you ever feel unsteady on your feet? If you uh, stand near a counter or a wall for safety, but you lift one foot off the ground, how long can you stand on one foot? If you close your eyes, can you balance it all? These are really important functional medical assessment questions. But when we look at preventing falls, it's a completely different set of questions and interventions. As we age, we need to maintain muscle strength. This is about continuing weighted exercise. It's about sufficiency of protein intake and also protein digestion. Maintaining enough uh, key uh, anabolic hormones like DHEA and testosterone. Making sure we have optimal levels of magnesium, which allow muscles to freely relax and contract. Uh, muscle tightness or spasm can contribute directly to increased risk of falling as people find themselves unable to steady themselves after they become off balance. Flexibility, uh, their hydration is key for this. Uh, stretching, different uh, mindfulness activities can also bring uh, good stretching exercises that help to allow muscles to not only be strong, but also flexible, just like the same wisdom we were speaking of with bones. Vision, oh my goodness, we lose our optimal vision as we age. Part of that is just based on the natural degradation of cumulative, uh, cumulative oxidative stress in the eyes. Uh, keeping good antioxidant function as we age is essential for that. Uh, a big contributor to loss of vision, especially things like uh, night vision, is insufficient vitamin A. Again, a fat-soluble vitamin. You need 
good hepatic biliary and gallbladder function in order to bring fat soluble vitamins into the body. Uh, but I think one of the worst culprits with regard to increased risk of falling is progressively insufficient levels of vitamin B12 as we age. It's probably the nutrient that most requires good, potent, strong stomach acid. Uh, in order to trigger the release of intrinsic factor in the gastric cavity, which binds with vitamin B12 in order to allow it to be absorbed in the intestines down in the ileum. Uh, so we need good, strong stomach acid to absorb, not just to digest, but to absorb vitamin B12. And naturally, as we age, we're more likely to struggle with some degree of hypochlorhydria and impaired ability uh, to optimally digest and absorb B12. Uh, we're more likely as we age to end up with a chronic simmering overgrowth of uh, Helicobacter pylori bacteria in the stomach, which uh, bacteria like to make their living space hospitable. And so H. pylori naturally moves in and sets up shop in the gastric lining and suppresses the release of stomach acid in order to further its own survival. But this is at a uh, a nutrient depletion uh, effect to the host. And so these are the types of things through the functional medicine lens of interconnectedness we need to understand and we need to learn to look for depending on the full picture cluster presentation of symptoms and history and diet uh, and all of these dynamics in a unique individual rather than a myopic focus on say just the bones. Um, unfortunately, modern conventional uh, allopathic therapy to increase bone density is largely about, like I said before, synthetically stopping the natural healthy turnover of bone tissue. But even if the therapies are about uh, trying to overtly boost bone density, uh, even if we're doing things like a bioidentical hormone therapy in order to do that, we're not necessarily increasing the bone toughness or the flexibility, the resiliency. And this is where, again, protein sufficiency, uh, digestion, absorption uh, are really key. And the intake of a rich diversity of other minerals, not just calcium. And so these are things that um, need to be considered primarily because fractures can be devastatingly life um, limiting. Uh, it's fascinating to look at the uh, sustained multifactorial lifestyle implications of a traumatic fall, um, especially uh, uh, things like hip fracture that can lead people to a dramatic loss of mobility and access and freedom, physical freedom, maybe social avenues. Uh, the You might be surprised to learn that the one-year mortality rate from a first hip fracture is between 22 and 30 percent, depending on the studies you look at. Well, comparison, that same data point for first heart attacks is uh, also in the 30s. And this brings home to us that uh, people can uh, become depressed and increase their risk of death from all causes for a lot of reasons that are not um, anatomical or physiological, but the, the emotional, mental, spiritual, social impact of a major bone fracture can be pretty dramatic. Hence our need to focus on not just taking care of bones, but preventing fractures by keeping people on their feet. Um, chronic low bone density is a, a relatively new epidemic. I find this really interesting. When you go back and look at the, uh, you know, epidemiology over time and, and look at what has evolved in time, um, we uh, are struggling with more of a modern epidemic of chronic loss of bone density, especially progressive loss. And what I find interesting, like any good science-minded person, when we look at a changing value, we shouldn't just consider what are we doing in our modern lives that's lowering that number, but also considering are we starting with less peak bone mass density to begin with, right? As I said, 
ideally our optimal peak bone density is uh, in the, achieved in our late 20s and our early 30s. But are we finding ourselves in our senior years with lower bone density because we lost more of it? or perhaps also because we started with less. And I think the truth, what the science shows is probably both. And so I don't have time today, we teach a, an entire clinical course on bone health, but I did wanna just summarize for you and review for you, when we look at the number of things that have changed, even just in the past uh, 50, 70, certainly 100, but even past 50 years, what are we doing? that's overtly affecting bone density, even if we uh, hone in on that as a singular factor, right? There are many different modern disease promoting dynamics that are at play. And we can get quite esoteric in talking about the science behind these. At SAFM, we'd like to uh, talk about the esoteric science, but also then boil it down to simple brass tacks because those brass tacks, simple stories, you can turn around and share with your patients and they can understand. And when people don't just change their lifestyle because they're being compliant, but they make different choices because they've been educated and inspired and empowered, they're much more likely to sustain healthier lifestyle choices because their, their intelligence is galvanized, right? <clears throat> but all of these are things that um, are much more prevalent today than they were. Again, as recently as only 50 um, years ago. But when we look and aggregate it, what do these things represent? Well, we, we tend to experience much more crap food, much more toxicity, and much more stress. Crap food, toxins, and stress. It's modern living at its best, right? At its sociocultural norm. Uh, today. And so when we're eating crap food, we're getting lots of calories and lots of chemicals, but not necessarily lots of nutrients. When we're exposed to high amounts of toxicity from multifactorial sources, we can overload our innate detoxification pathways. And then we end up storing toxins and experiencing chronic oxidative damage from that burden. And then stress, I think, is the most insidious of all three of those things emotional stress, mental stress, social stress, biochemical stress, physical stress. And all of those things can easily uh, put our bodies, our nervous systems into a more of a chronic sympathetic nervous system mode, which is a survival state that we're really designed in to be only uh, to use episodically for true survival. And other ways remain primarily in a parasympathetic nervous system. But modern life is sending us into an anabolic state, uh, excuse me, a catabolic state more often than not. Catabolic where the body is breaking things down to free up resources to make sure we can fight and flight and hide and survive, which is a wonderful utility. It's kept us here as humans. It's why we're still here in this modern day and age having this conversation but it's at a cost. It is a catabolic state that we're designed in to be, we're designed to be in episodically for short periods of time. And then shifting over into the uh, restorative parasympathetic nervous system state, parasympathetic state where we're emphasizing physiology and biochemistry that helps us to rest and digest and heal and make babies uh, in the name of thriving in times when our survival is assured. And so this shift into crap food, stress and toxins changes a lot that overtly changes our body's ability to maintain optimal bone density, not to mention all of the other systemic effects that can contribute to a lower suboptimal bone density. Uh, and I'm, again, you're getting these slides, so I will leave you in the interest of time to explore these on your own. But again, I think so much of our uh, conventional lens of bone health is oversimplified. This is a great quote from a, a lovely gentleman, a physician who lived next door to me a number of years ago. He and I would chat about uh, different disease dynamics in the driveway. And, uh, you know, this is a great quote. You know, I just don't understand why we're struggling with bone health, right? It, I mean, it's just about vitamin D and calcium and you got to take a lot of them, right? But, you know, clearly it's not that simple. There is a huge interconnectedness of disease promoting factors here. But the biggest message I want to leave you with, if you only remember one thing from today's presentation, 
is that bone loss is a catabolic action that the body upregulates on purpose as part of carrying out systemic inflammation. And as much as we now think about, oh, systemic inflammation, that's bad. No, it's not. Systemic inflammation is why we didn't die out a long time ago, right? So that when the body needed to fight uh, pathogens and toxins and invaders, right? That we had good, potent defenses. Uh, and internal to the body, again, it's inflammation that helps the immune system to identify and contain uh, a rogue cell, like a cancer cell or a disease cell or an old dysfunctional cell, like a, uh, uh, we find in, in old bone tissue, right? It's, it's health promoting. It is when it becomes chronic and dysregulated that we end up with this huge host of chronic inflammatory lifestyle the diseases that our patients struggle with today. And so something that can we can easily lose sight of is that, yeah, osteoclasts, again, are immune cells, right? Uh, like I said, they're, they're derived from monocytes. It's a specialized macrophage. It's part of immune function. And when there is an increase in inflammatory mediators in the body from any cause, the body increases osteoclast activity and this breaks down bone tissue. And if it is sustained in time rather than episodic, then yeah, people are going to end up with osteoporosis. I mean, osteopenia or osteoporosis. That's not a surprise. It's a logical outcome of a very well understood physiological process. And so if we want to help people avoid uh, chronic uh, suboptimal bone density, we've got to address the root causes of systemic inflammation. Progressive bone density loss is a mechanism of chronic inflammation. It goes hand in hand. Uh, osteoclasts also play an active downstream role in T cell differentiation, uh, helping to create a balance between T helper cells and T regulatory cells that ensures that we have a uh, pro-inflammatory, anti-inflammatory balance right? That um, allows the immune system to be quick and strong and incisive, but with an already slowly applied inflammatory break that helps to minimize uh, the uh, peripheral collateral damage, oxidative damage from having an uh, overamped immune system that can't regulate itself, that ends up causing all sorts of havoc in the body because of inflammatory fire. I've given you another uh, few uh, resources here, but in particular, uh, the first two of them, I think are just fantastic resources, uh, expanding on the diagram I've shown here of just how pervasive the role of a bone cell, right? An osteoclast is for affecting uh, immune function and how much inflammation then further stimulates that activity uh, in boosting the immune system as long as there is a call for inflammation. Well, again, if that's infectious or episodic, that's great. But if it is a chronic byproduct of our lifestyle, we're in trouble. And this is why teaching people to make health promoting cha uh, changes in their daily lifestyle choices is at the root of all sustainable healing from chronic disease. Now, it makes perfect sense that during times of high stress and inflammation and threat that we would upregulate this catabolic activity, right? That's not the body uh, going rogue on us or doing something uh, uh, dumb, right? Uh, the body is doing this to promote survival because catabolic activity, just like in muscles or in fatty tissue, uh, it frees up protein and calcium and phosphorus, which uh, help us uh, to do things like run for our lives uh, and to survive all sorts of uh, stress and threat. And it has undoubtedly kept us alive again to be having this conversation today. Uh, some really interesting articles I think we've just started to embrace in the past um, uh, 10 years, in particular, uh, the, the role of um, bone tissue in regulating immune function. I love seeing words like osteoimmunology, right? 
uh, and the connectedness also potentially of bone diseases and autoimmune diseases. It's a really interesting arena of research that I think it's really going to start to explode in the next few years. Hormones play a role, but so often uh, bone health uh, conversations are limited to the notion of estrogen. And I think in particular, we need to remember the criticality of thyroid hormone optimization. We have a true ep epidemic of hypothyroid function, uh, mostly largely unacknowledged and undiagnosed because we're thinking that TSH is sufficient for assessing systemic intracellular thyroid function. And it is, of course, not. Uh, it can't be. It's a brain hormone. And other tissue will has different sensitivity to thyroid hormones than uh, the brain, than the hypothalamus and the pituitary. But as we say at SAFM, sluggish thyroid, sluggish anything, not just sluggish GI motility, sluggish immune function, sluggish liver, sluggish brain, sluggish osteoclast and osteoblast, right? We need thyroid hormone optimization and we need to be checking true full thyroid panels to assess that. But the larger message I wanna give here is about progesterone. We focus so much on estrogen and estrogen is important, absolutely, right? Estrogen helps uh, to regulate the behavior of osteoclasts so we don't have excessive breakdown of bone tissue. But progesterone in so many ways teams to provide balanced function with estrogen. And it's actually progesterone that plays the much more potent role in increasing the activity and also the differentiation of osteoblasts, which are making that new bone tissue. So if all we do in focusing on endocrine therapy for bone density is focusing on estrogen, it makes perfect sense that it can be at significant cost, where all we're doing is stopping maybe the bone tissue from excessively turning itself over, but we're not necessarily doing enough to overtly boost the synthesis of new bone tissue. And estrogen and progesterone throughout uh, our lives, not just in women, but in men as well, and not just premenopausal women, in women their entire lives, uh, estrogen and progesterone have synergistic coupled effects. So when we talk about bone health, we need to be talking about balances, right? It's about uh, not just calcium, right? Minerals and protein and amino acids, strength and flexibility, right? Not just slowing osteoclast, but more importantly, boosting osteoblast activity. Uh, it's estrogen and progesterone, right? Premenopausal health and postmenopausal health, right? It's it, the whole uh, common a uh, cultural adage of, you know, the health of kids is sort of optional because, you know, they're young, they'll get over it, right? Their body parts are newly minted. That is not true. We know now that the roots of things like insulin resistance and uh, chronic immune dysregulation begin in little ones. It doesn't suddenly appear when they turn 27 and show up in your practice. The roots of this are beginning. And so boosting Things like um, nutrient optimization and healthy movement and healthy emotional functioning. All of these are essential in young people as well, especially if we want to have optimal peak bone mass density in our 20s so that we have a higher perch from which to uh, readily and easily weather a slight drop in that bone density, which is a natural part of the perimenopausal, postmenopausal experience. We need to be uh, boosting uh, uh, anti-inflammatory and pro-inflammatory uh, pro immune function, right? We don't just want to have a strong immune system that's out of control, right? We want to have that pro-inflammatory, uh, excuse me, that anti-inflammatory break, uh, which is a key part of parasympathetic uh, immune function. Movement and rest, right? It's not just about impact activity. It's not just about weighted exercise to build muscle. We need to rest in order to calm the immune system, in order to move out of a sympathetic dominant nervous system mode to keep our bones thriving. 
we uh, an interesting spin on this is we want to balance discipline and also relaxation and that either of those extremes that can create a lot of, of stress uh, on the body, either an overly rigid and rigorous life view, which can be very stressful for people, or an overly uh, lax, non-attentive to health and nutrition attitude, or maybe one of excessive indulgence that can create physiological or biochemical stress on the body. But as usual, the sweet spot scientifically is somewhere in the middle that allows balance. It's not enough to take in nutrients. We also have to digest and absorb them and convert them and get them past the cell membrane if we want to nourish our uh, physiology and biochemistry. It's not just about calcium. We need to be getting optimal levels of K2 and D3 and magnesium. Uh, we want to support the bones, but also the environment, the entire system in which those bones are functioning. We want to prevent falls, not just have dense bones. Not just weighted exercise for strength, but also stretching. Uh, activities like yoga and Tai Chi for flexibility. Assessment and prevention, right, in terms of getting in front of this. Uh, and not just focusing on rapid relief, the pill for the ill, but actually working with a unique patient to get to the root cause of their unique chronic inflammatory dynamic that is logically creating a progressive loss of bone mass density. Uh, and as I said earlier, we believe that the best way to do that is through education, inspiration, and empowerment of the people you serve. Because when people know better, like really viscerally know better and understand it, um, they are much more likely to make sustainable lifestyle choices. Otherwise, patients tend to be compliant as long as they're afraid. And as long, when they stop being quite so afraid, they're much more likely to fall back into prior habits because they're convenient, they're comfortable, without the galvanizing, the new beginning that comes from really richly understanding what's at play in their unique bodies. So um, I, I give you some additional information here. I just uh, pulled a few select slides from our clinical course on bone health. But when we think about testing for, for bone health uh, for the medical practitioners out there, these are classic markers that um, some of which you may use or maybe you don't use. So this could be a trigger to look at the comprehensiveness of your assessment, but it's also essential to look at all of the major drivers of the other chronic inflammatory dynamics that may be simply driving a loss of bone mass density as collateral damage for some other systems, chronic inflammatory dynamic. Uh, I'm not going to talk about these in the interest of time, but I, I did give you here. I know uh, Fullscript has some awesome resources about nutrients. And I've tried to add here just a little bit of additional information to help you expand uh, your lens and assess uh, what other nutrients might be at play with regard to sufficiency uh, for bone health. Uh, and so you can uh, check these out and give you a few references for some of these. Uh, but again, I like to say that, um, you know, we don't have, it's not like your kitchen where you have a whole bunch of storage foods just in case, right? You don't have time to go to the grocery store or go to the garden or bring in new foods. So you go to your pantry and you've got some storage there to help you out. Well, it doesn't work that way internal to the body. I like to say we don't have a pantry of nutrients in our left butt cheek that we can just go to to get a little more zinc or a little more magnesium or a little more vitamin A when we find ourselves in a pinch. The reality is every single solitary biochemical pathway in the human body is fueled with nutrients. And if you don't bring in those nutrients, those pathways don't have a mechanism of sustaining themselves with magic. The, you must bring on board the nutrition to fuel those pathways. And those pathways will progressively slow and become dysfunctional. And we shouldn't be surprised when that results in eventually really notable disease eventually disease that's severe enough to be diagnosable. But why would we want to wait for that? Why would we do that disservice to our patients? We want to intervene up front. We want to help them to ideally understand some key 
truths about human functioning so that they can head them off at the pass. But at a minimum, we want to engage early and address some of these imbalances before they become severe enough to be diagnosable. Uh, and so I leave these for your uh, exploration uh, as you wish, but I do just wanna say a couple of quick words uh, before we close about calcium. Uh, calcium is certainly the nutrient that is most promoted in every, uh, I believe, medical and health arena, especially the conventional uh, ones, um, as a remedy. Um, but calcium is a bit like estrogen and cholesterol and fibrinogen, right? Really important life-promoting and sustaining substances. But if there's too much of them, and especially too much of them in the wrong place, they can promote not only disease, but death. And it's actually very well understood at this point in clinical study that supplemental calcium intake, too much supplemental calcium intake, uh, overtly increases the risk of a variety of different manifestations of cardiovascular disease. And it's believed that one of the primary mechanisms of this is the calcification of plaque uh, in um, the lining of our arteries, which not only furthers atherosclerosis, but starts to create arteriosclerosis. And we lose endothelial function that the body naturally needs to have internal to our vessels so that they can flex and move and vitally dynamically respond to our uh, changing environment, our changing needs. But, um, I share with you here a number of references. I gave you a whole bunch of them because I really want all of you to understand. Again, another key pearl that I hope you take away that this is not an out there kind of concept. It's been very well understood uh, that bolus doses of supplemental calcium, uh, and I can't tell you, you may have experienced this as well. How many people have come into my practice over time where they're taking 1500 milligrams of calcium sometimes even more, which is crazy, but 1,500 milligrams of calcium first thing in the morning with a cup of coffee because that's what they were told to do. That's what they perceive as a health-promoting choice. But bolus doses of anything uh, risk inappropriate use because the body has evolved dealing with various nutrient availability based on its presence in food. And so it makes perfect sense that the safer and healthier way to supplement uh, with, with minerals in general, but especially calcium, is in divided doses with meals where the, the digestion and absorption of them will naturally be slowed by the presence of food, where we have other cofactors needed to enhance optimal calcium uptake. Um, but getting away from risky supplementation and doing the research to really understand what are the risks. And, and there are other supplements that um, present with this as well, right? We want to be intelligent utilizers of the blessing of high quality supplementation. But calcium in particular, I find, is a risk that is either not well understood or not well educated um, to patients so that they can make the safest choices uh, in, in using calcium supplementation. So a number of different pearls here uh, for you on this topic um, that I hope you take to heart. But I, I hope this has been a quick, uh, uh, certainly uh, dive into the fascinating interconnectedness of bone health through the functional medicine lens. And it's a good reminder that nothing in the body, absolutely nothing acts alone. Everything is interconnected, not just physiologically or biochemically, but from our entire aggregate life system, our environment. Uh, and, and this is why it's so important that when we are doing good, thorough assessment and support of a unique, precious being in front of us, a, a patient, an N of one, we want to always be asking not the oversimplified question of what's the diagnosis, what's the disease, how do I fix it? But who is this person? What is their unique environment, interconnectedness of functional balances and imbalances that will naturally precipitate a whole host of symptoms downstream if it is sustained over time? And how can I, where possible or where needed, provide rapid relief, provide uh, acute or emergency support? But that's only the beginning of care. How can I go upstream? 
in the, the biochemical and the physiological cascades to actually find the, the dynamics of disease and even further upstream, the true root causes in this unique person's body, in this unique person's life system so that we can address it at its roots. And then it will naturally go away on its own. No management, no long-term side effects or consequences of drugs required, right? Medications are blessings for short-term use to arrest a debilitating or potentially life-threatening dynamic. But all drugs have collateral uh, consequences with long-term use. And our opportunity is to do better than that, to know better and therefore do better so that beyond a medication use, we partner with a unique patient to help them address the disease dynamics and the true root causes. So the body naturally in its wisdom and exquisite symphonic design, the body naturally finds vitality again. And this is possible with so many different disease dynamics through the functional medicine lens. So I wanna thank you all for joining me uh, today. Uh, one thing in particular that I want to um, offer to all of you uh, as a further learning uh, through the functional medicine lens, we have a, a very rich actually four webinar series on true root causes of disease. Uh, in the human body. And we wanna make this available uh, to all of the participants here uh, free of charge. Uh, these are good, rich uh, sharing of uh, all sorts of additional clinical tips on different dynamics, whether it's uh, adrenal dysregulation or intracellular hypothyroid function or insulin resistance or toxicity. This four webinar series touches on all of those and it's uh, my, my pleasure to offer that to all of you. All you have to do is uh, click on this link uh, and uh, again, we're going to be sharing the slide deck uh, in order to go and access that. And uh, I'm delighted to be part of your continuing uh, education. Uh, I appreciate very much that all of you as practitioners are busy. And I know it takes a real commitment to continued scientific awareness and learning in order to make time for webinar presentations like today. So thank you so much for joining us. That was uh, that was great, Tracy. Thank you so much. I know um, uh, there were a couple questions that come through. I know you hit some. I don't know if we have a couple minutes now. If you want to go, or you know, we can send sure. them in the follow up. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I I a lot of them were asked at the beginning, so uh, you definitely covered them as you went, kind of thing. Um, but there are a few few ones that um, we could probably cover quickly. Um, so even right off the beginning, you know, uh, someone asked to clarify the benefits of MK4 versus MK7 and which which do you think is better? That's a great question. Uh, and I, um, for a deeper dive into that, I would actually recommend <clears throat> on the footer of that page is a link to a, a vitamin K resource guide that Chris Masterjohn put together. And it actually explains uh, the different ways in which MK4 versus MK7 is distributed into the body and when you may want to use one versus the other for particular purposes. Uh, I, I would actually uh, recommend MK4 uh, if, if bone health is a the primary concern, right? If we're looking at sort of managing uh, calcification of soft tissues, then maybe a combination of them would be more appropriate. Or if we're looking at things like um, uh, endothelial function and trying to deal with calcified, uh, reducing the risk of plaque calcification in our arteries, then perhaps NK7 may be a better choice. Uh, but they certainly have overlapping functions, but they're, they're distributed in the body differently. And in terms of making sure that good copious amounts get to the targeted destination, this is where the form can make a difference. Uh, and so hopefully that's helpful as a quick answer, but the resource guide yeah. uh, is one of the best I've seen specifically on vitamin K. Yeah, I think actually there's quite a few questions about vitamin K. So um, we'll kind of leave, leave, leave it at that one so we can, um, they can, they can access that guide or that resource from the slides. Um, we have, let's see, we have a couple more. Um, so 
Um, excuse me on my pronunciation of this as well. So we have a question. I have a patient, a teen girl with recurrent osteomyelitis. Myelitis. Mm -hmm. <laughs> do you suggest, um, what do you suggest in terms of supplements? Uh, so uh, that's a great question. And, and actually I would say through the functional lens, um, it's actually going to depend on what the larger manifestation, the larger manifestation of disease is, right? Because again, if we think about the bones as being uh, a, a, a thing, I teach uh, people in my own practice is think about the the bones as being part of where the inflammatory battlefield is raging uh, the most aggressively. And so uh, in that particular dynamic, we need to go elsewhere and look at you know, what are the other imbalances that are at play? Certainly something that a lot of young girls struggle with that, believe it or not, can actually present with a pretty dramatic contribution to these types of dynamics is an imbalance in sex hormones, right? I think most of us know we have an epidemic of estrogen dominance in young women and the early stages of things like PCOS dynamics. And then without, um, with either intermittent or maybe lacking or suboptimal ovulation, we end up with lower levels of progesterone, maybe with optimal or normal levels of progesterone, but we end up with this imbalance uh, in these steroids. Uh, and that can actually contribute to some of this downstream imbalance and dysfunction internal to the bones. Uh, so I think that is uh, key. Um, and then the reality is that uh, toxicity, uh, toxicity is uh, just so widespread and the bones are also places where we store toxins. And, um, you know, I remember years ago when we were first putting together a clinical course on toxicity and detoxification. And when you learn all of the different mechanisms via which toxins exert their disease promoting effects, you know, everything from mitochondrial uh, dysfunction to actually impairing the detox enzymes that will allow the body to get rid of them in the first place. Uh, it's, it's pretty insidious, but unfortunately we do have to think about the bones as being a place where the body stores toxins, uh, especially heavy metals, right? They're minerals, you know, the body will incorporate them in situ, mm -hmm. um, but especially lead. And that, that's the point I wanted to get to here, right? We see a lot of those toxic effects of lead postmenopausally in women when they're losing bone density and the lead comes out of storage and goes back in circulation. But young people are also struggling with the exposure that can cause problems decades later. And so young people aren't necessarily thinking about or learning about or even hip to toxins at all. Uh, and so those are two arenas that I would really focus on in terms of a larger look, right? And in terms of, you know, what is happening in the body, uh, in terms of the immune dysregulation that is usually at play in that dynamic, I would look, I would assess, actually, I would measure vitamin D, vitamin A, and red blood cell zinc, uh, making sure in particular that red blood cell zinc is in the upper half uh, of the normal range. Again, because so many young women are estrogen dominant, they're more likely to retain more copper than zinc. And so this is where uh, there can be a connection between the endocrine effects and the immunological effects. So that's a super quick fire hose answer, but I hope it's yeah. helpful. Yeah, no, I think it's great. And, um, you know, we've gotten a few questions coming through last minute and a lot of comments on how great this presentation was. So. Um, I think for the sake of time, we can kind of wrap things up, but I can let people know too, um, if there's more questions, they can always email Fullscript um, or webinars at fullscript.com and potentially I could pass mm -hmm. them along to you or your team or, um, you know, re-watching the presentation and having access to the slides might also answer answer some of the questions that come up. Yeah, sure. The other thing I'll offer is that um, at our website, uh, schoolafm.com, there's a whole bunch of public informational resources. And if you, you know, put in the word bone and just search on the word bone on the public resources, a number of uh, additional resources, articles or videos will come up. But each of those has a QA and a utility under it. And so if you can just find the applicable, an applicable post, if people still want additional information, we have a clinical education team that would be happy 
to provide some additional support. So yeah. I'm, I'm happy to offer that. Yeah, perfect as well. And as I said, we'll send the slides out, but um, we can also put a direct um, a direct link to that that webinar, um, complimentary webinar access to, um, in mm -hmm. in the on the landing page or in the email. So there's lots of resources coming your way. Um, and again, if you have questions, you can head to schoolafm.com or email fullscript at webinars at fullscript.com. But for now, I'm going to say thank you so much, Tracy. That was amazing such a wealth of knowledge and a great presentation i know um we got a lot of a lot of great feedback from it so i hope to see you again in the future and um for now i'll say thank you and for everyone to have a great rest of the day